Thanks, Francis. Let's just quickly do the technology. We get this up. And we'll share that. Okay, so so I'm Rod Page, and I, I guess my role in this project has been partly as a slightly cranky um, outsider. So my background is I'm a um, professor of taxonomy at the University of Glasgow, so I'm an academic. I have a background working uh, in academia and teaching, some connection with museum collections, and I've been involved in, in publishing, editing a journal uh, in the past. So what I wanted to do is, is give a sort of interested party take on lots of these kinds of developments. So one thing that I think um, is causes a, a number of issues in, in the context of PIDs is just a sheer diversity. Anybody coming to this landscape is going to be um, surrounded by lots and lots of acronyms. There are going to be logos. There are um, all sorts of different projects and things, and this can make things um, quite sort of challenging. So there's arcs, there's DIYs, there's orchids, there's pearls, and so on. And I think part of the issue here is that actually um, this focus on uh, identifiers or PIDs can sort of get a bit, a bit um, sort of distracting in a way. So in many ways, by focusing on PIDs, we might lose sight of some of the bigger kind of issues. And it's almost as if we get a kind of cargo cult culture going where people sort of assume that if we have a PID, wonderful things will happen. And while that is possible, um, you won't get there just by PIDs alone. So just to give you one sort of cautionary lesson, uh, there's a persistent identifier uh, in use in academia for identifying people, it's the ORCID ID. Um, you've probably noticed, if you read um, papers, you'll see these kind of little green uh, circles here with um, the ORCID ID logo in them. So this is my ORCID ID profile. Now I kind of geek out on identifiers, I really like them, so I've gone to town and I've added links to my publications and data sets and all these kinds of things, because I really like identifiers. But not everybody sort of is on board with them. So here's a, a different ORCID profile. Now this is for somebody called Ian. And all I know is that there's a person called Ian, I have no idea what they do, but they have an ORCID ID. And for somebody like me, who is very interested in linking data together, for example, I would like to link people's publications to the museum specimens, to the taxonomic names they've published, all these kinds of things. This is completely useless to me. Uh, I don't know who Ian is or, or what this person does. But I think this is a byproduct of focusing on the PIDs, on the identifiers. So I think it's almost like we're developing a sort of um, a Gary Larson problem in a way. In the, this is like the classic sort of cartoon that you, you, you know, your dog's done something bad and you're telling them off and you're saying, Ginger, you've been very bad, I'm going to punish you next time, Ginger, don't do that. And of course, what all the dog hears is blah, 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 Ginger blah, blah, blah. So I guess one of my concerns is that in this discussion of persistent identifiers, what people tend to hear is you need to get a PID, you need to get a PID. Um, and that's all that we hear. And the sort of Ian's ORCID profile is, is kind of a symptom of that. Because if you keep saying we need PIDs, and that's all the people hear, then you'll get PIDs, but that's all you'll get. So essentially Ian was told he needed an ORCID ID, and he did exactly that, um, but it didn't actually generate much real kind of benefit. So I think maybe it's worth um, rehearsing uh, why we need PIDs. So at a very sort of high level, why are we doing this? So this is a, a sort of very quick uh, sort of history lesson in a way about the origins of the web and the origins of PIDs. At the top line, you can see one of my heroes, a guy called Ted Nelson, who in the 60s was sort of talking about hypertext. So way before the web, way before even the internet, there was this notion that we could link things together. And he talked about having these two-way links between documents that would have a built-in measure of citation. And this would be a sort of a wonderful way to link our knowledge together. And in fact, Ted Nelson coined this term hypertext. He had a dream of the system. It was complicated. It was never built. Tim Berners-Lee, who built the World Wide Web, sort of greatly kind of simplified the system and said, look, we're just going to have things that link to other things in one direction only. We're going to link to things. So your web page here on the left, 
might link to somebody else's web page on the right. Uh, we're not going to have any idea of citation built into this. If I link to another web page, that web page has no idea that that happens, but it's fine. And also, he said it's kind of okay if this happens. So if something disappears, if a web page vanishes and your link breaks, that's okay. And the reason for that is, you know, your own web page is still there. So the system was really robust. If if links sort of broke your web browser would still work, you'd still see something. Now, I guess the, this makes the system very simple and we got the web. The one sort of disadvantage, I guess, is not only do these links break, but if somebody comes along and fixes it, like puts up a new web page, you've got to go and change your content, content over here to point to this new web page. So you've got to change things. So you are not particularly insulated from these kinds of changes. But it's a simple system, got us online, works beautifully. So in a sense, PIDs, which are down the bottom, are a sort of way to try and insulate ourselves a little bit from these, these breaking links. So the idea is you've got a web page, and instead of linking directly to something else, say a specimen of a collection or a scientific paper, you link to the PID. Now, if, for example, the original web page you're interested in goes offline, which, you know, happens, in a sense, you're kind of isolated from that change because you've linked to the PID. So your expectation is whoever's running that PID will come along and fix the link and make it to the new web page and it's all good, but you didn't have to do anything to your content. Because you pointed not to the page, but to the PID, for example, a DOI to a paper, your content's sort of still there. It's kind of insulated from these changes. So that's one of the practical reasons why people advocate PIDs. So linking to an identifier that shields you from, um, in a sense, other people's incompetence about keeping their content online. So armed with that idea, so, so what can we do with them? Well, there's all kinds of things that we can do with persistent identifiers. So one thing we can do is basically just go and grab content very, very simply. We don't need to search for it. If we have an identifier, we can go and get it. This is perhaps the most extreme example of that. But if you want to get a paper in a hurry, you can just simply use the DOI and there are services that you can just put in a DOI and you'll get that paper back more or less instantaneously. So this is all driven by having an identifier for a paper. So one of the first things you can do is it makes it easy to get access to content. If you have a culture where people collect things, so academics are forever collecting papers, be you uh, a researcher or a student preparing to write an essay, there's this culture of you will collect a list of papers, and you'll stick them in some, say, a uh, reference manager program or something like that. If there's any culture where people come along and collect things, identifiers make this really easy. You don't have to manually type in information, you just put in the identifier and the software to do the rest. So identifiers are great if people want to collect things uh, that are of interest to them. And there's also um, a lot of potential for using persistent identifiers to generate metrics because they sort of take away the issue of, you know, what is it that you're looking at? So every time this particular publication is mentioned, if people use the DOI, then it doesn't matter if it's on Wikipedia or if people are tweeting about it or it's in a news article, or in this case, it's been, this is a publication on species numbers that's been mentioned in various policy documents. If everybody's using that same DOI, this very simple little identifier up here, then you can track the usage. And I think many of us would love to have this, this kind of sort of feedback on the impact uh, of the things that we do. This is a, a case here of a scientific paper, but imagine that for any object you have in some kind of collection. So PIDs make a lot of these kind of things relatively straightforward and achievable. Now, I think it's worthwhile noting that I think, I guess one of the challenges for fields like, for example, natural history collections or cultural collections is perhaps certainly initially, maybe not everything has enough value to get a PID because you know, PIDs can be expensive. What I mean by this is not that individual objects don't have value, but sometimes the value might be more in the aggregation than in the individual things. So for example, we often think of, of Facebook as taking our data, we give it away for free, and then they then make a huge amount of money from that, they should pay us for our data. 
Well, if they did that, we'd probably find that our data is actually not worth very much at all. We wouldn't actually make much money from that. The real value is in the aggregation. And in the area that I work in, which is um, biodiversity, you often have biological specimens in museums in Hiberia. Very few of these have persistent identifiers. Uh, almost none of them have identifiers, for example, like DOIs. But you do find identifiers for collections or aggregations of this information. Let me just give you um, an example of this. So this is um, a, a lovely plant specimen in the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh, one of the uh, project members. Now, I'm not saying that this particular specimen has no value. It has great um, scientific value. It might not be terribly beautiful to look at, but it, it is uh, important and useful. It has an identifier. Uh, that the Botanic Gardens have assigned to it. But for example, it doesn't have a DOI. So in a sense, whoever is in charge of the money at the Botanic Gardens has not yet decided they've got enough money to put a DOI onto this particular specimen. Interestingly, if you look at the use of the specimen, for example, in um, a scientific publication that mentions that specimen, uh, the publication itself does have a DOI. It does have a persistent identifier. So some things about the specimen or some mentions of the specimen are considered uh, to be valuable enough to have a DOI. If you go to um, a website called gbif.org, which is aggregating all the natural history specimens from all around the world, uh, the Royal Botanic Gardens is in there, their entire data set, that has a DOI to it. And indeed, if you download any particular data set from GBIF that may include material from the Botanic Gardens, those downloads also have DOIs. So in some situations, it may well be that the, the, the argument for the persistent identifier might be better made at the level of an aggregation or a collection or a data set that somebody is going to use, um, uh, rather than necessarily um, for the individual objects themselves. So in order to make um, PIVs useful, um, it's also not enough just to have a persistent identifier. There needs to be a sort of ecosystem built around that. And one of the most important things, I think, to make these identifiers useful is to make them uh, machine readable. That is, if I have a persistent identifier, not only can I go to a nice website that's designed for me to have a look at and get some information, but also a computer or a machine can do that as well. And maybe to, to make this sort of um, clearer, there's a, there's a metaphor that, uh, this is not original with me, it's, I stole it from somewhere. An example of a sort of human and machine readable thing is, for example, your credit card. As a person, you can read the numbers. So maybe you're ordering something over the phone, you have to read out the numbers and the expiry date and so on. Also, you can insert it in a machine or in fact, just sort of wave it in the general direction of a machine and the machine can read it as well. So ideally persistent identifiers will give a person something useful to look at, like a nice picture of a specimen, but also give a computer some nice structured data that they can do something with. And to give you maybe just a couple of examples of, of these sorts of things, this is the, um, the PID demonstrator that um, we sort of put together for this project. The idea here was to basically take some of the existing identifiers that we have. For example, this is again, Hibarium uh, in Edinburgh. This is their begonia specimen that I was sort of talking about earlier. It has an identifier. You can install a little bookmarker in your web browser. If you're visiting this page in the Hibarium, you click on it and up it pops with a little thing displaying, oh, I know the specimen it's been used and cited in a particular paper. And likewise, you could do the reverse. You could go and visit the publisher's webpage with the bookmark click, click on that and see, oh look, this, pu this publication refers to material in this herbarium. And the key point about this little demonstrator was it relies entirely on the presence of identifiers for both publications and specimens. And we didn't need to do any changes to any of the underlying websites. And of course, you know, we don't control the publisher's website at all. And we didn't have to do any changes to the Hiberian website. It just uses the identifiers to make, make the link. So that's a, a very simple kind of demonstrator tool for some of the possibilities of making links between items and collections and their use. Um, it's still, it's very toy-like. If you want something a bit more impressive, there's a, a lovely tool called um, Entity Explosion, which is a great name. This is developed by um, Toby Hudson in Australia. 
And it's a little bit like the sort of little PID demonstrator tool, but, but it's much more powerful. What it does is it can visit more or less any web page you're looking at. And if there's an identifier on that web page that it recognizes, it will go and talk to Wikidata and say, do I know anything about what's being shown on this page? Now, what you're seeing here is, this is a very niche web page. This is a, um, a page in an Australian government website. It shows a publication on fish that's supposed to be in Russian. And it's part of the Department of Environment and Energy. But there's an identifier for the reference on this web page. And with this extension, if you put it in a Chrome or a Firefox web browser, you click on a button, and up pops a whole bunch of information from Wikidata. In this case, this paper, it's actually a Russian paper, so the text is in Russian. We've got a DOI that the Australian web page didn't know about, the author's name, and so on. And this entity explosion is basically driven by people using identifiers for their content and adding those identifiers to Wikidata. And I think this might be one route for people to consider demonstrating the value of identifiers is if you get identifiers into something like Wikidata and have those identifiers visible on your own content, then suddenly people can discover um, a much richer world of kind of connections through these particular identifiers. So I guess just to sort of, to summarize. So I think um, the success stories for, for persistent identifiers and, and to sort of calibrate that, probably the most successful one that I'm aware of is the use of uh, say DOIs by Crossref to identify the academic literature and have all these citation links. I think the real success stories are driven by uh, things having value. There might be financial value in terms of publications or intellectual cultural value. Um, but these things need to be important and to be valuable, either in terms of the items themselves or the links that they have. Or perhaps it might be that aggregations are valuable. In the contents of natural history collections, often it's the collection of specimens that's more valuable than any particular individual one. And I think the story that we need to tell um, shouldn't be just about PEDs, just about identifiers. It should be about what we can enable, the ease of linking, discoverability, and aggregation, the possibility of developing metrics of use and impact. So we need to, I think, to move beyond PIDs for PIDs sake, uh, so we no longer have any more IANs in our databases. Um, that's what I was going to say. I shall hand back to Francis. I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. Um. Thank you so much for that, Rod. That was uh, a great insight. And I also want to thank you uh, on behalf of the project, uh, not just for today, um, and mention to everyone uh, joining us here today, actually, that I think it's been great to have Rod in the project as a kind of critical friend, I think is how we've uh, described your inputs to the project. And I, I highly recommend uh, everyone have critical friends within their projects uh, going forward uh, to kind of ask the right questions at the right time, because sometimes we, we, we've needed that within the project. And I think uh, the insights that you've given us just there kind of really highlight uh, some of the things we need to continue to, to have discussions about from this point forward. Um, uh, Patricia has also noted in the chat, uh, thanking for the reminder about thinking about the, the bigger picture and actually what we're trying to achieve when those of us are quite focused on the, on the PIDs work, uh, pulling back and looking at why we're doing this uh, is definitely very helpful. Um, does anyone else have any other questions they'd like to pop in the chat or the q and I can't see anything coming through. Um, so I think that takes us uh, a tiny bit ahead of time on to the next part, um, which is our other project partners uh, commenting on a few of the things that they have also learnt uh, through doing the work. And again, we pre-recorded this um, to uh, give us a bit of time back in case we needed it. Um, so Francis, over to you to play that, I think. Heritage PIDs is obviously a very big topic and um, I think there's a lot to take away from this project. Um, but if I'm to focus on a particular area, um, 
I think I'd say that even just working through the Natural History um, Museum case study with Francis was a really useful exercise in its own right. So at the NHM, we have a particularly complicated legacy of different specimen identifier schemes that's built up over many years, um, often developed within the silos of individual departments or different databases. And um, these are generally only unique and persistent within a limited context. And while they did the job that they were needed for at the time, once we got to the point of embarking on larger scale digitization across the collections and publishing data through an institutional data portal, we wanted to be able to make automated data pipelines and to link our data to other data resources and provide them to aggregators. And for that, it was clear that the existing identifiers were not fit for purpose as persistent and globally or even institutionally unique identifiers. So we then had to create new identifier schemes to support those new activities, but also support the links back to the old identifiers because as they're written or printed on millions of specimen labels and cited in literature, there's no way we can just replace all of them or get rid of them. And so we have to continue to support those legacy identifier, uh, identifiers for the foreseeable future. And on the flip side, we're now working as one of the partners in the DISCO consortium, um, DISCO being the distributed system of scientific collections on setting up a PID architecture for digital specimen identifiers that should ultimately be rolled out across 130 or so institutions across Europe. So we're really seeing things at both ends of the identifier spectrum. So something I would take away from those experiences and from the wider Heritage PIDs project is that even if the time and resources that I have to invest right now are only enough to act locally in a small scale, say within my own institution or department or within a specific system or data set, then it still helps to think about the bigger picture. Firstly, being aware what PID systems might already be available that I can adopt like ORCIDs and DOIs and therefore let someone else do the heavy lifting in serving up those PIDs and ensuring that they're globally unique, persistent and resolvable. And I think those are probably the more low hanging fruit <clears throat> in terms of being relatively low efforts to implement while providing major benefits and linking and enriching our data. Um, but secondly, if the situation means that I do need to implement my own identifier scheme, then at least a knowledge of PID principles and good identifier practice mean that I'm less likely to reproduce the issues of the past and add to that burden of legacy identifiers that will need to be handled in the future. And in both of these respects, I think that the, uh, the guidance from the project on developing identifiers for heritage collections will be a really useful resource and also a roadmap from whatever position you're starting in to incrementally improving your use of PIDs and also thinking ahead to what you might want to do in the future and actions that you can do now to make that easier. PIDs have enormous potential to allow us to make connections between cultural heritage objects and to give a system of referencing and citation. At the moment, they're still understood by relatively few people outside specialist circles. With the resources produced by this project, we hope we've demystified PIDs and the opportunities that they offer. This project is part of a long term shift from thinking about the details we hold about cultural heritage collections as information to seeing those details as data. Creating machine readable data like PIDs is an important part of that, and it sits alongside other ways of viewing and connecting collections that are in the parallel towards the National Collection, IIIF and Heritage Connector projects. Together, all these technologies show there are really powerful ways that we can make collections both more discoverable and useful to researchers. This shift to data and joining up collections comes with a strategic need for the sector to invest more in infrastructure, systems and data, not just the technology, but people. It's been very key to this project to have an expert who has not just the technical skills to produce the demonstrators, but an understanding of the data itself. We need more people with these skills in the sector, and if I had the funding, I could easily double my small data team. For smaller organisations, it's going to be vital for PIDs to be made hassle-free to use, or it simply won't happen for them. This might mean, for example, major collections management systems having features that enable PIDs to be minted and added easily to those collections. That's a pretty long term prospect, but the case studies show that organisations using PIDs are already seeing tangible benefits from institution level PIDs. The biggest benefits would come from a wider scheme, and that would ultimately require the resourcing of a central infrastructure for cultural heritage PIDs. Being part of this project has helped in seeing the different interpretations different sectors take over the seemingly simple phrase persistent identifiers.
The needs for such a thing to exist have been part of cultural heritage organisations for centuries and are close to, but not identical to, the more recent needs of the academic publishing community that has created much of the recent persistent identifier infrastructure. The project has clarified these differences, which helps to explain the gaps in the current persistent identifier infrastructure for cultural heritage needs and the different resourcing issues in cultural heritage that could help drive further implementation. To adapt the William Gibson quote, persistent identifiers are already here in cultural heritage, but they are just not very evenly distributed. To assist cultural heritage organisations of all sizes in the further development of persistent identifiers, the report makes clear that work is needed to be carried out in collaboration with the vendors of cultural heritage systems, which would need to implement such infrastructure. In turn, this requires standard setting and ad ad adaptation for the particular needs of cultural heritage. And finally, it requires sector-wide cooperation to move from persistent identifier silos to persistent identifier commons. So as a collection manager and non-technical person, I should make that very clear, um, I came into the project with the now obviously very naive idea that PIDs were an established technology. We almost take DOIs, ORCIDs, etc. for granted. The links are just there, we click on them and they work. And so from my point of view, in my head, the project was really just about encouraging collection managers to make more use of them. What's now very clear is that it's actually a much more complicated landscape particularly in relation to the infrastructure that's essential to facilitating genuine persistence. I think the project has shown that there's a genuine desire within the sector to take advantage of all of the benefits of PIDs, and it would be great to see the development of a cultural heritage sector equivalent of Crossref or something like that to enable that to happen, particularly in support of the local museums where that technological support to use the PIDs is going to be very challenging. Locally, from an RBGE point of view, the process of developing the case study for the project provided an opportunity to review our work in this area to date and to identify aspects that we want to look at going forward as we begin the process of digitising our library and archive collections. As an idea, PID seemed relatively simple. A unique persistent ID for the information we need to use and reference. However, this project has helped to highlight that making the most of PIDs can require a bit more technical know-how and sometimes commercial services. Within museums, the idea of PIDs have been understood for many years, with their perceived function being met internally with inventory numbers and object titles. However, as our work has become more digital, with documentation reports and images all being stored as files and in databases, along with the need to compare and find these digital resources across multiple institutions, the need for a more robust and trusted PID system is becoming clear. Many institutions use very similar inventory numbers, and as an example, the National Gallery has around 30 paintings titled Portrait of a Man, so they're just not fit for purpose. The Heritage PID project has provided a valuable platform to discuss and explore how PIDs are used and can be used. The case studies have provided a great insight into how several large institutions have experimented with PIDs in the past and are developing their usage going forward. The online PID resource also provides a great starting point for people considering PIDs along with useful references for people already working with them. It's been very valuable to talk through the various issues of how PIDs can be implemented and used within the project webinars but also within the internal project meetings highlighting options for individual researchers right up to large national institutions. It has become very clear that one of the key steps to ensuring that people can find, access our work, allow it to be integrated or interoperable with other digital resources and be explored or reused over the long term, i.e. FAIR, is to tag it with a unique, persistent identifier that can be used as a long term, trusted digital reference for all. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you very much there to all our uh, project uh, co-eyes and contributors. Um, we haven't had any questions come in yet, but I wonder if you would like to uh, switch on your cameras and unmute yourselves um, and whether there are any responses you have to each other's <laughs> comments on what you've learned from the project so far. We've had one question come in uh, from Gessin, uh, 
uh, thanks Gessin, uh, who is the uh, PI on the Locating a National Collection, who asked about Rod's idea of a database of pid to pid connections, uh, including citations, um, and whether there are comments on what standards could be used for such databases of connections, who would create it, uh, and who would maintain it. Rod, is that something you'd like to comment on, uh, given the work you'd put into doing similar work for the demonstrator? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so, so in the context of citations, for example, for the academic literature, um, so Crossref, which is the organisation that runs the DOIs to identify individual papers, basically encourages any publisher, when you upload your data for a publication, to also include a list of DOIs for everything that's mentioned in that paper. So essentially, if you look at a modern article, you'll see a list of literature referenced already has links. Crossref more or less insists that publishers make those available uh, if they have them. And I guess what makes it simple for Crossref is they're fundamentally the same thing. They're talking about we're, we're a database of publications with links to publications which are also in a database. So it's the sort of simplest case. It's very, very powerful, but it's very kind of simple. Um, and there's also been, there's been a big move to make those links openly available, which is sort of behind us. Um, so if you want links between different things, life gets more complicated. I mean, some might argue that at some level, things like Wikidata may be starting to play that sort of role. Um, but the academic context, it, it's done by Crossref. Thank you, Rod. And I, and I wonder if there is a role in whatever systems we're using to make what we can of our collections uh, available online to expose those links, if you like. And so rather than being maintenance, it's about exposing what we all do have so that other folks, whoever's interested, can aggregate that information somewhere else. Um, we have a question from Rebecca asking about what would be needed to develop a pipeline of people who combine technical skills with an understanding of the data. Who would like to answer that one? I can give it a go if you want, Rachel. Yes, please. Um, the problem generally with this is scope. Uh, when you start exploring one area, so PIDs, there's actually a lot of different ways to do things or different things to take on board. And having some kind of a simplified introduction to that technical area would be required really for the people who then know the data to know where to start. And if you then sort of expand that across lots of different areas of technology that touch on heritage and museums and, and libraries and archives and, and things, it's actually tricky for people to know where to start. So I, I would say that to develop a pipeline of people uh, with these sorts of combination of skills, we would need some kind of renewable uh, training process to say that, you know, these are the core skills kind of used within uh, cultural institutions. These are the core technologies that are being developed. Uh, these are the people who offer them. These are the issues for small, medium and large institutions to engage with them. And if people can then touch on that kind of training with some kind of regular basis, then people can keep track of it. It's, it's the, the issues of people who have a strong technical skill and understanding of the data are the few, lucky few, who actually that's their job. Um, but for everyone else, we need some kind of simplified place to, to touch every now and then just to check how we're going. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Jack, as this is something you raised, would you like to comment also? Yeah, so have, obviously having proposed the, um, the challenge, I think some of it is about building um, enough of these roles that people can move between them in cultural heritage as well because we tend to really value them but when you're it needs a range of people so you need um, technical architects you need people who directly manage data um, and there aren't a lot of these jobs at the moment even in quite large organizations and so we risk losing those people to outside the sector so some of it is about actually saying we need more of these roles and then when we get the people in um, investing in them investing in their development as, as Joe has indicated 
um, and encouraging them to stay within the sector because actually it's very valuable. We, we have people who've worked from the Natural History Museum who had a slightly more advanced position because in science, there's a lot more joining up of data than in cultural heritage. Um, so um, if we can recruit and retain more people into the sector, I think that's that's an important part of it. Um, and then for everyone else, it needs to be part of the mindset almost. And I think as you've seen generational shifts with other things like social media, there is the opportunity as new people come into the sector to get them thinking about um, it as data to get them wanting their uh, their data that they're, they're putting in about their collections to be out there in the world rather than the traditional view of cataloguing it um, for the quite particular purposes of one institution. So it's it's a combination of a mindset shift, a scaling up of of the kind of resource that we have in the sector, and then the kind of um, training that Joe has described as well. Thanks, Jack. Richard, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, was, I, was, I every, agree with everything that's been said. And, and I guess the other thing on to that, I would say, is that providing a, a home for those people in a place in the organisation, because it is very much one person at the moment in places and they leave and everything falls over often. So it, it needs to be built into the the systems in the organisation that it's not just seen as a nice to have, it's just part of what the institution does. Um, I think that's a huge change that's needed. But also, yeah, um, the pipeline of people with their skill, I think is um, a, a huge problem to get over and maybe adding on, there's lots of data engineers out there, so I'm not quite sure how we bring in cultural heritage to them or vice versa. I think that's probably the point at uh, university courses. Maybe there is something, modules that people can do to expand beyond just looking at um, stock market prices uh, in their data science courses. Thanks, Richard. Uh, Joe, you had a response. Um, I was just going to say, just you know, the small plug for standards. Uh, one of the tricky things has been lots of fabulous technical things done in museums uh, over the years, but we've all done them slightly differently. So that the mobility that Jack was talking about and the, the transference of skills that Richard was hinting at, it, it's problematic if you then have to learn a completely new way of doing something when you move from one institution to another. If some of the approaches in the future can embrace even just domain standards, they don't need to be proper standards with inverted commas. Um, it makes it easier for people to learn how something is currently done and move from one place to another. Now that's not always possible, but that's, you know, that, that would help um, the transference of skills. And thinking about those domain skills, obviously Rod coming from the slightly more STM angle interaction with collections here, I guess a question for Matt and Lorna, who are uh, from institutions at that intersection, does it feel easier to find those kind of technical skills along with the, the domain and the collection based skills? If I can jump in, I, as a relatively small organisation, I would say it's a challenge um, in terms of every post that we have, in most cases, is multitasking. It's very difficult to bring somebody in specifically to do something. So a lot of the skills that we have internally have been developed by people, by people who just happen to have an interest and can take it forwards. Um, and I think that's a challenge and again that's a particular challenge for us because then having developed those skills they then often get poached by other organizations um, and it's then whether we've actually got capacity to bring that person back in because there's also core functions that would have been in their job description that they've got to try and meet so there's a lot of multitasking going on um, and I think that's where the need for central resources for it to be integrated into systems so that actually there is that support is just so important Thanks, Laura. Yeah. Matt. Sorry, yeah, just to build on that, I think it is, it is relatively rare to to find people with those technical skills who have the domain background. You have a lot of people who have the domain background who both, I think, as was already mentioned, over the course of the time, they get more interested in data, more interested in the technical areas. And so they do upskill and they move into those roles. 
but it's quite rare that um, museum or cultural institution will give them the then the kind of fundamental technical training that they probably require to get to the next level where they are able to build these kind of sustainable structures. Um, and at that point, that's where you need to try and get external expertise in. And then you hit that barrier of, well, it's very hard to compete with the private sector when it comes to salary. So you have these kind of <clears throat> magical unicorn people that occasionally do come up and they are very interested in the subject matter. They have a very technical background and they just happen to either be both be prepared to and be able to afford to work for current salaries that are actually uh, you get in the glam sector. Thank you, Matt. Um, and Rebecca also thanks you for your responses. Uh, just picking up on another question, um, I think this will be the last one and one that I think Rod's already um, put in a response to around VIAF identifiers or Wikidata Q codes, whether these are a good bet for identifying people and whether there is awareness of any activity to link those up to ORCID identifiers. Um, just while other folks have a chance to think about that, I can comment that the scope of ORCID identifiers is very much on active researchers or contributors to research. And therefore, there are going to be a large number of folks that we want to identify uh, within our collections both as collectors or people represented within our collections who aren't going to have ORCID identifiers. Um, and so absolutely things like VIAF and Wikidata and international standard name identifiers or ISMEs, uh, which are, tend to be used to identify copyright holders in works are actually going to be really important because not everyone we want to talk about will have been an active researcher, is still an active researcher and is able to create and manage and maintain their ORCID. So from my point of view, absolutely, we need to look at things like VIAF and Wikidata and how we represent that within our metadata so we can identify all kinds of people. Um, does anyone else want to comment on that, Richard? Well, it takes you part of the way, but um, if you're actually interested in anyone who ever lived, then, um, even the, these other resources um, are going to fall short. And um, so in Wikipedia and Wikidata, you have this concept of notability. And basically, unless someone is, quote, notable, um, then they're, they're not meant to be in there. And occasionally you have notability wars where people um, get put in and, and then they get taken out again by someone else. Um, and, um, you know, looking at this as a community, I think that there's data that we want to record that maybe we can't just sort of hand off to someone else to do that job for us. I think that there may be challenges that we need to face as a community, um, because it's obviously not any individual institution that's going to produce the authoritative list of anyone who ever lived who was interesting. Um, but we either do it individually and find a way of bringing it together or we have someone who takes it on on behalf of the community. Thank you, Richard. Um, any comments, responses to that? Could I maybe just, just jump in? So I'm, I'm a huge fan of Wikidata and I think it's going to play an increasingly important role, <clears throat> mainly as a sort of identity broker, because what you're now seeing is that you can have a record for a person that also mentions the VIAF, the ISME, a record in a French library database, the ORCID ID if they're alive or recently alive. And the notability for criteria for Wikidata are much more relaxed. The, the criterion is more or less, does this person exist in, in an external database? Um, and as an example, I just put in the chat, there's an extraordinary project called Binomia, binomia.net, uh, by David Shorthouse in Canada, where he is basically linking collectors, be they alive or dead, to specimens in our museums. And his identifier for a person is either the Wikidata ID or an ORCID ID, which also is almost always in Wikidata. And that might give people a kind of sense of what you can do. But I think Wikidata's role here, it's the, the sort of point of entry to all these different identifiers that I think is going to be an, an increasingly important role for a particular project. 
And I think that's also where it's important for us to advocate for the identifiers that we do start to use across the community to our colleagues um, at Wikidata, at Wikimedia, to make sure that we are cross-linking these identifiers where we have multiple identifiers that might represent uh, one person so that it doesn't matter where your entry point is, uh, that you can still find your way to the entity and information about that uh, person or place uh, even that we're talking about. And saying person or place also leads me to raise some conversations we've previously had at the British Library about identifiers for uh, people or entities who may or may not have existed or have been real at any point in time. So various deities, etc., who are represented in our collection uh, and how we represent them and who gets to uh, say who or what those entities were uh, and what they represent as well is also uh, an important question, as well as the actual people we know definitely did exist. Um, there has a question come in to the Q&A box, which I'm going to address briefly, um, asking about um, in order to sell the use and value of PIDs more effectively to executives or digital content teams, has anyone got positive cost benefit examples of tracking the equivalent of web, web page hits where people are making use of data with PIDs from heritage organisations. Um, I think the answer to this question is that we don't have enough of that data yet. We don't have enough in use to really demonstrate and do the cost benefit analysis. One of the things that we had wanted to do through the case studies is look at if we could describe the cost of the implementations that we have so far. But because of the kind of tentative piecemeal long-term approach we've got within the case studies we've done so far, it's not been as simple as saying, well, how many hours went into this? What did that cost? We've just not been able to answer that question. Um, what there is out there at the moment that is related is some work that UKRI um, have paid for to look at the benefits of use of persistent identifiers for data exchange in scholarly communications. So that's information exchange between uh, universities, their funders, publishers, etc. And the benefits in the exchange of information using persistent identifiers to prevent rekeying. Uh, and there is a link to that uh, going to be within our final report. And if I can dig it out before the end of this session, I'll put it in the chat, which actually looks at literally that one benefit of preventing rekeying of information and how that adds up across the whole higher education sector as a benefit of persistent identifiers. And the figures are uh, quite impressive <laughs> for a relatively small intervention of having DOIs and ORCIDs. Actually, that kind of adds up uh, quite nicely. Thank you, Francis. Francis has added the link to that in the chat. And I think it would be really nice if we could get enough examples and the points where we can collate enough data to understand the, the cost benefits to heritage more specifically. Um, we had hoped to do that within the project, but there just wasn't the data for us to, to start to do that within the project. Um, but we will talk about that in terms of work to carry forward uh, after today. So thank you very much to uh, co-eyes and partners on the project uh, for your input. And um, we were due to have a break at half past. We are five minutes early for that. Um, but if we could keep to a 15 minute break, uh, Francis, I know you had a link to a timer and I haven't opened it. I don't know if there's something you can pop up on the screen. Um, we'll have a 15 minute break and then we will come back to look at the recommendations from the project and have a panel on next steps.